people in America fear their government, and the government is being run by too many powerful agencies like the IRS and others, I think it's time the people take the country back through their representative government. Hey, Mr. Politician, living on that hill, living in that lot of luxury, on we the people's bill, don't have a clue how the other half lives, and that is a shame, it's time to stop the tyranny, you keep pushing through your bills. Going for revolution, going for it now. It's time to save our constitution while we still got the guns in our hands. Hi, I'm Renee Kimball and welcome to Freedom TV. We've got a very interesting show for you today. It's going to be about a local producer who produces an extremely boutique product that has been illegal for the last 35 years and now it is illegal. No, it's not pot, but it's really a good product. So we're going to be talking about that later, but first I have a little bit of an introduction of something that I just learned today from the internet in regards to the inaugural ball. On the inauguration ball night there are usually uh, maybe as many as 20 or 30 balls that the president goes to and he has to pick and choose and of course some people get left out and some people get included. However there's one particular ball that the president excluding I thought was a bit shall we say tacky and did not send a very good message and that ball is called the salute to heroes inaugural ball and what this one in particular is is the one that's held for all of the people in the United States who have won the Congressional Medal of Honor and for me not attending the function of the people that we hold up as our acme of role models for as people who've given their all and given everything to, for bravery and for the country to me is kind of not a really good message. So for me, Mr. Obama, if you could sort of politely consider the possibility of getting your priorities a little bit more in order as to the kinds of things that you lend an ear to. And as far as I'm concerned, people like, oh, I don't know, Jay-Z, Kid Rock, I mean, Stevie Wonder's nice, but Mary J. Bilge, Usher, Faith Hill. These are all nice people, but I'm sorry, when it comes to role models, they don't sort of hold a patch on people who run the Congress won the Congressional Medal of Honor. So that's my little piece for the week. And with that, we're going to be going to see Sheltering in Place, which is our, we're going to be changing uh, the uh, introduction for our surviving and thriving segment and sheltering in place this week is going to be our segue. So sit back, relax. Well, I don't know whether you can relax after seeing this one, but it's exceptional information. So sheltering in place with surviving and thriving. It's nice to live in our own little world, which makes it easier to ignore the ugly threats to our preferred way of life. But sometimes bad things happen, and just ignoring them won't make them go away. Would you know what to do? We need to deal with certain situations in life before they become a real problem. It's a little like putting something away for a rainy day, but what we're putting away here is knowledge. Would you know what to do if a dirty bomb went off nearby? The truth is that public reaction could do more damage because of the lack of information and understanding. What if something worse happened? Would you know how to deal with the effects of fallout? What if I were to tell you that it wouldn't be the end of life as we know it? A little information can go a long way to easing your anxieties because you'll know the facts and you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know what to do. So let's talk for a moment about dirty bombs or perhaps something worse. 
An incident has happened. You may not know if it was a dirty bomb or not, even if you're right near the location. If the explosion was bigger but farther away, a bright flash might be your best indication of what you're dealing with. In either case, you want to do something called duck and cover. This is where you find the nearest solid structure as quickly as possible and duck down behind it while covering your head with your arms. You should remain in this position for about 30 seconds. After you're sure it's safe, look for a building nearby. If the windows and walls aren't damaged, quickly move yourself into it where the walls will shield you. Make sure you cover your nose and mouth with an article of clothing to reduce the risk of breathing in smoke or radioactive dust. And if you're in an office building, make sure you stay clear of all the windows. Once you're inside, and if you are near the explosion, remove just the outer layer of your clothing and put them in an out-of-the-way corner, or seal them in a plastic bag if one's available. Also, put the clothing you use to cover your mouth in the bag too. Remember, removing outer clothing may help get rid of up to 90% of radioactive dust. If at all possible, shower or wash with soap and water, especially your hair. This will help get rid of any remaining dust. If there's a radio or television nearby, tune to your local news for more information on what to do. When the opportunity to evacuate becomes available, make sure that you are moving away from the incident and perpendicular to any wind or airflow. And remember, the more you learn about what to do, the less you have to be afraid of. Bye. For more information about topics such as these and how to be prepared for emergencies, go to www.physiciansforcivildefense.org. The shelters range from the Madison County Courthouse with a capacity of over 19,000 persons to the Grant Building here on the Courthouse Square also with a capacity of only 78. The shelters are owned primarily by local governments, including the County Commission, City of Huntsville, our school systems as well. Another important component is our private sector. We have many businesses, including uh, the Schiffen Building here on Courthouse Square, South Bank, the Church of the Nativity. Huntsville Hospital is one of three local hospitals that participate in the Huntsville Metropolitan Medical Response System program. We have identified fallout shelter spaces in all three of these hospitals where the staff, patients, and their families will be protected against high-level radiation and they can continue medical operations. Huntsville, Madison County, Alabama is establishing a countywide radiation monitoring network based on the nuclear radiation monitoring device which will be carried by police, fire, and other public service vehicles throughout the county. Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV and today with me I have Rich Phillips and he is one of the local boys with a very local organization called Integrity Spirits, which I think is great and it's an amazing idea. First I want to ask you, why spirits? I mean, you know, I, I read some of your bio in the background and I'm going, and he decides to go into distillery? <laughs> I don't know. It's fun. It's fun. And really. there's a lot to it. Um, and also, I would say that it would be my partner, Kieran, that helped me. Because um, really, it was he that um, started the whole thing. And uh, we just kept messing with it, really? you know? And How it, long ago was this that, that you guys started? Well, I mean, we were kind of messing around doing tinctures and things like that as early as... 96 or 97 really? or something though. like that it was really um because i don't know it was fun it was intriguing it was forbidden it was one of those things that um that we said well we can't legally make it at home yeah but we can make tinctures we can make um different essences of things and stuff like that so why don't we just mess with it and just see what we could find out with right. this but then it was just it's the intrigue and the history and all that other stuff I mean this goes back I mean the first uh, the first distillery on public record is the Bushmills distillery back in 1608 really oh my and god so you know you look at how that was and how it went so far before that and everything but you know the revenuers had their way and yeah, right. so they did that but um it's just 
it's a phenomenal thing where you think that, oh, how hard could it be to yeah. take... How hard could take, it be? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> how we thought about it. Yeah. This is the, take mash and we'll just get alcohol. That, oh, well, this vaporizes at 174.9 degrees and this at 212. Oh, crap, everything in between there is fine. Yeah. But no, because then you've got all these lighter vapors and heavier vapors and different right. elements that are going on that really you start to learn about chemistry, which goes right. back to when you're in high school and college and you think, oh, I'll never need this. I'll never need chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you wind up doing a business that is absolutely dependent exactly. on chemistry. Mm -hmm. Right. And now, why distill, the, you do four products, mm -hmm. four basic products. Right. I think they're, they're the vodka and gin, two, two gins. We have two different types of vodka right now. Um, we have a straight vodka, which is right. called Lovejoy. And something we kind of pulled out of thin air, or Karen did on a whim, um, Lovejoy Hazelnut. Right, well, Hazelnut, Oregon. Well, yeah. that was kind of the idea. Yeah. Um, we do a gin, and then we do an absinthe. Right, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, mm -hmm. because absinthe itself has a whole history all by itself. Yes. But why did you decide to do spirits as opposed to beer? I mean, Oregon sort of Because everybody beer else does beer. Okay, like, that's you know, true. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, let's yeah, let those guys do that. Let the other guys do that. And because we'll, we'll where their job ends is where the distiller's job begins. Really? Yeah, because you still have to come up with something that has booze in it. So right. you have to make washes and you have to do ferments. Right. And so you have to have, like, if I was going to make a whiskey, which we're working on, um, we're going to need beer. Really? Just think about this. Um, if you do a two-row barley, well, that's traditional. You can do six rows as well. But if you do a two-row barley without hops and you distilled it, you'd have the basis for Scotch and Irish whiskey. Oh, really? So they're basically the process for distilling the spirits and mm -hmm. distilling beer is pretty much very similar. It is. But it's you'd wind up with, a, with an entirely different product. Yeah. Right. Well, I know we've got a few pictures. I want to show some of the... Uh, pictures that we've got of the early days of the facility, starting mm -hmm. with the early days of the facility, and some interesting pictures about the things that you do produce, and then we'll come back and Fair talk enough. a little bit more. And then in the second part, we're actually going to have a look at some of these very, very interesting and exotic beverages. So if we can have the pictures up, we'll look at the first one. This is the one of the pictures of the very early days of where you were and where you are now. And this is... Uh, what did you have to gut the area that you went into and yeah. completely redo um, everything? I, that's a bit of an understatement. <laughs> um, there was a lot of stuff in there, and we gutted it. And um, I'm not really sure what was in the back at the time, but boy, it took a lot of work. And this was, in those days, this was uh, Kieran's primary job because I had the day job, right? And I ran um, the highest volume liquor store in the state and whatever. But uh, boy. We hung a lot of drywall. Right. We, a lot of work. Yeah. And this is another picture, another view of the inside. Unfortunately, I didn't, I couldn't get any pictures of the finished product. So if you guys want to see the finished product, you're gonna to have to go and and visit the location, because I didn't, I couldn't find any of the the finished pictures. Oh, you know, because I think that <clears> I didn't <throat> do the bigger pictures when we. Oh, you know, the, okay. When you're into a project for a year and yeah. a half or something, oh, like everything that. becomes old hat, mm -hmm. you, you know. And then our next picture is the now. What is this area? The, That's our nice packaging color. room back there, and that guy's name is Jim Ingram, and um, that poor guy. We, he painted so and much painted, stuff and, and painted every you know you know <laughs> every nook and cranny got could, painted. Yeah. Now I couldn't quite tell what this was. It was an interesting well, this woodworking was, piece. This is actually our neighbors, uh, the Green Dragon, when they were building oh, their okay. place out. We did it in conjunction with each oh, other. Okay. And so there were two guys, Jim Parker and Lauren Lancaster, mm -hmm. that um, wanted to start this, and we talked to them because we thought, how cool would it be if under one roof we could have. A public house, a brewery, a distillery, and a tasting room. Wow. Have everything under one cover. Mm -hmm. Sort of like I, I make minimums, but only for the good stuff. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And the next one is, this was interesting, the still. And I couldn't quite, how is This is copper. our Alembic still that we bought from Portugal. It oh, was really? It was handmade for us. Wow. Um, I wish they would have remembered a drain at least, but we figured it <laughs> out. And this is before um, we actually now have it positioned up on like a oh kind of a metal cage or whatever where you can put burners under right. it. Right. So now how, how big is that? 
uh, 138 gallons. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't look anywhere near that big. That's. I thought it was like, you know, no, it's, 8 or 10 gallons. It's oh, it's big. huge. Yeah. yeah, so it's one of those things where it gets so cold in the winter time that we hug it because it warms <laughs> us up a bit. It warms up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is the funnels was the title those are, of this. Those are actually glycol jacketed fermenters. Um, oh, the one okay. The far end is pretty big. It's about 917 gallons. The others wow. are about, they're close to 300 gallons a piece, but they have a glycol jacket around them so that you can heat them or cool them, depending on what you right. do. Because if you're going to run your ferments, well, you want to be able to kind of control that thing. We want to let those spores actually do their thing and right. create booze and carbon dioxide, which is what yeast does. Right. And so if we can keep the temperature under control, that's what we're going to use for whiskeys and rums and, you know, if we do brandies, then we'll do right. that. But then that's where it starts. Right. Okay, and this is the keg room. Mm -hmm. Actually, this was, um, we were building out, you, if you can see where the chain link is, that's where the barrels are to go, and that's mm -hmm. where they are now. Okay. But I, I got a deal because I knew some guys out at Jack Daniels. And oh, they gave okay. us a deal, so I had to order these barrels, <laughs> and they showed up, and uh, Kieran called me and said, what are you doing? I got all these barrels here. I'm like, I'm really sorry, but I had to get them now. Yeah. But there is, there's a worldwide traffic in barrels. Really? Yes, because um, a lot of people from, you know, the bodegas in Spain mm -hmm. um, sell their sherry barrels and everything to Scotland, and Jack Daniels and Maker's Mark sell a lot of their barrels to um, not only Spain and Scotland, but they sell them to a lot of the rum producers. So and there's like this ever-changing worldwide, yeah, worldwide, worldwide traffic circulation of barrels from one. It's crazy. It's really insane. But um, that's why it was so precarious. It's like we need these to yeah, age Yeah, you need to them. get them right now. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think this one was titled the, the, packaging, the packaging Room after it was painted. And then uh, we started building the little... Uh, I guess the packaging tables and stuff like that, and just started slowly getting the equipment in there. Right, and this is this was this was entitled the boys. Are mm -hmm. these the people, that, the customers, or are these well, people who work there? They or are both. They're both, <laughs> and because um, we kind of had a little pre-opening party, and it's funny that you picked this picture because you have Red. These are all friends of ours. You have Red on the left. Tom Cook in the middle and Steve Lloyd on the right and they all showed up just to help us you know we had our little preliminary party or whatever that's great and uh, they've just been great friends even though they talk a lot of trash <laughs> so you know but that's what friends are for exactly and this is a picture I couldn't resist this dog is amazing yeah this, this is, is uh, a tribute like uh, Jackson is the dog hundred and well in his youth he was a hundred twenty pound boxer that was Kieran's dog, and uh, he got him at seven weeks old. Oh my God! And he was so cute, you just almost cry over this thing. Yeah. Oh. And it was just, it was hilarious because he was so big, and then we had a mutual friend, Rebecca, who had this cat that we call LG. Yeah, somebody was asking me if it was a bobcat, and I went, I don't think so. He's about as close as you can get. I mean, he was uh, 28 pounds or my something gosh. like that. And uh, that picture was taken at my place that they'd all kind of fallen asleep on each other, yeah. and we just thought it was precious. Yeah, I know one, so, one of the crew uh, wants a picture, a, a copy of that picture, because she thought it was so cute. Mm -hmm. And this is some of the the bottling. I was fascinated by this. Is this sort of the process, uh, part of the process of, of getting the the liquor inside the bottle? Yes, is it, it is. That, this and is so great. Basically, <clears throat> we get our glass, and uh, it comes to us from a silk screener out of California. But mm. The original bottles come from France, which is another story. <laughs> but um, we blow them out with compressed air because they're sanitized when we get them, but we don't want any dust or any of that. Right. And then they go through a gravity-fed bottler, and then we roll them out like that, and we cork them, but we do it all by hand. Really? So this is, is literally a hand operation. Oh, yeah. Great. And this looks like a lot of bottles. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's one of those things. It's like, hey, boys, let's have a bottling party. Yeah. And you could see in that picture on the right, you have uh, Jeff Howard, who is another guy who's, who's doing great work for us distilling. Hmm. And he's a machine. 
And then there was another guy, Colby, that was helping. He just showed up one day and said, hey, can I help? And that's, that's the thing that's so beautiful is these guys. That's incredible. They just show up and they try to help whenever they can. And that's, that's part of the beauty of having your own business is you can, you know, invite people in to help you. Sure. These are a couple of pictures and we're going to have the real things very shortly. And I, 12 Bridges, where did you, is the name, where did you come up with the name for tw of 12 Bridges? What is that synonymous no, I think with? a lot of it was um, like with everything is what we did was, it was this discussion that we had, that we've lived here for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. We like the place. Yeah. But then, you know, Portland Brewing, yeah, passe, whatever, I mean, yeah. things. So it's like, how could we, how could we talk about this place that we like to be and still have an alluring name or right. something that if right. you were in New York or Chicago or wherever you were, yeah. how could it work? And 12 Bridges, for example, was right. a bit serendipitous because we were talking about things like that. And we knew that there were 12 Bridges in Portland. But we talked about some other names, and then we went back, and we were sitting there, and uh, all of a sudden I was going through, like, our formulas, and I was like, holy cow, we have 12 botanicals. Oh, uh, okay. And that's how we did that. Yeah, 12 Bridges, and 12 And it was serendipitous because it's like, oh, I got 12 of these. Yeah, it just fits. Right. But also, um, the intention is that we're going to, every different run, like every year or whatever, yeah. we do a different run of glass. And so the next bridge, because this is the Hawthorne Bridge, the next bridge that's slated is the Steel Bridge. Oh, okay. So you work so, through all of them. Great. That's excellent. What a clever idea. And we have only two minutes in this one, so before we have to go to the break. But uh, I just wanted to show, this is the, the range of the... The, I think these are the, I can't see that far. They're the straight vodka. They're the straight vodka. Um, well, there is the hazelnut that they put in the mix, but I know that there are four different labels on the straight vodka, and that's a confusion factor. But also, I got to quote Chester Cheetah from the cover of Cheetos. This you can trust, hip clothes or a must. <laughs> but to mesmerize, one must accessorize. One must accessorize. So that way you've got four different labels you could pick to adorn the decor of your bar. Whatever. There you go. Mm -hmm. Hey. And the last one is the signature, the Trillium bottle, which I think is an amazing. And that's we're going to spend a bit more time talking about. And we're, I don't want to give too much information. We're going to go to break in just one, a few minutes, but first before, very quickly, I want to tell you about a workshop that I'm doing next Saturday, and if we bring up the screen on that so people can copy this down. This is a free workshop, and this is what you can do with all those leftover Christmas cards and calendars that you have from previous years. I'm going to be showing you all kinds of ways you can use origami and cutouts and patterns and all kinds of stuff and things you can, you can do with those Christmas cards that are really incredibly amazing, including make these tiny little beautiful boxes that are good for gifts or just having around the house. So join me next Saturday at the Smile Station. We're going to be downstairs. That's 8210 Southeast 13th. And it's going to be all morning. Drop in whenever you want. Bring scissors, a ruler, and a pencil. If you don't bring them, we will have extras there, but if everybody can bring their own, it's really good. So now we're going to take a short break, and we're going to go to the first roll-in that we have. And uh, speaking of Trillium and things being illegal, and for silly reasons, we're going to take a short tour of something called Raiding California. This is from Freedom TV. And it'll give you a good idea of some of the craziness that's going on down there with things that really shouldn't be illegal. So, Raid in California, Freedom TV. We all want what's best for kids. But when there's a disagreement about what is best, who should have the final say? Parents or politicians? It has the kind of natural beauty the Golden State is famous for, but life here is calmer than San Francisco to the north or Los Angeles to the south. With sunshine, surfing, and safe streets, California's San Luis Obispo County is a good place to grow up. Well, I was 17 in high school, you know, just about to graduate. Owen Beck played football and soccer for his high school. You know, pretty, pretty oblivious to you know, all the problems in the world until it happened, so. 
I was playing soccer and uh, it was really hurting one day when I was running. So I just kind of had to stop playing soccer and I went and got an MRI and it was just a medium sized tumor just in the middle of my leg. Doctors told Owen he had bone cancer. Well, I started crying. Um, and, Owen's parents, um, Debbie and Steve. And then they said to Owen, the doctor said to Owen, this is going to change your life. Actually, at the time, I was just concerned with, you know, me getting through the next day. The whole family's calm California life stopped, and the Becks headed to Stanford Medical Center. I was worried that he was going to die. 17 years old, your life just stopped. Chemotherapy began right away, and the chemicals attacked Owen's hair follicles, stomach cells, and mouth. So I got a bunch of mouth sores, which was very painful. Couldn't eat very much and then it, it destroys your appetite, and then whatever you can eat, you throw up. And for Owen the athlete, yet another blow. Doctors amputated his leg to try to stop the cancer from spreading. When I woke up from surgery, it, it kind of felt like my leg was still there. And pull it all up and slide it right into the sea leg. Owen was introduced to a bizarre new agony called phantom pain. It felt like Someone had driven, you know, thousands of nails into where my leg would be. For the first three months after my surgery, you know, I'd, I would just lay awake at night because I couldn't go to sleep because that hurt so bad. All the powerful medications available in drugstores seemed worthless. We had a whole medicine cabinet in there full of pills that he took every single day, and it did nothing. Debbie and Steve searched for anything that would help Owen feel better. One option, however, just wasn't on their radar. You know, I don't think I'd ever really thought about that in his, in his situation because of his age. A new kind of drugstore had recently come to the nearby city of Morro Bay. It offered medical marijuana. State government allows for medical marijuana, and local officials welcomed the new dispensary and its owner, Charlie Lynch. Before we even opened, I had uh, the mayor and the city council members all came by and toured the facility. That's the mayor shaking Lynch's hand at the ribbon cutting ceremony. The new dispensary helped spark discussion between Owen and his dad. I was just talking one day with my dad and we just we brought up the subject of it. And it was like, if that'll work, that's what we're gonna do. The Becks knew that many people think it's inappropriate to give medical marijuana to a minor. In fact, again and again, the local sheriff has made it clear that he doesn't want medical marijuana dispensaries in his county is not in the best interest of a community that prides itself in providing a healthy family environment. But the Becks weren't concerned with what other people thought. They were focused on helping their son. You're going to do what you need to do to help your child. So the Becks got a written doctor recommendation and headed to Lynch's dispensary. Since Owen was 17, one of his parents would have to purchase the medical marijuana for him. He, uh came in with his father. He was looking really thin and sickly, and that's definitely a sad situation for, uh, you know, for such a nice guy. Several times we would go in and, and Charlie would say, you don't pay, it's, it's we'll, we'll take care of it, because he was just kind of a compassionate kind of a guy. The medical marijuana improved Owen's appetite. It eased his pain and nausea like nothing else had. It was the traditional meds that made him feel stoned. They, they would give me hardcore painkillers, you know, they would just make me dull out basically and fall asleep. But you know, with the marijuana, you know, I could, I could do what I needed to do during the day and just not be in pain. I could, I could be comfortable. Owen's experience is more than one person's anecdote. The medical benefits of marijuana, also known as cannabis, are well documented. Cannabis is amazingly useful. As a matter of fact, it's probably too useful for its own good. Dr. David Behrman has spent about 40 years treating patients and studying cannabis. When you see the list of things that cannabis can help, people say, you're pulling my leg. So many prominent organizations look favorably upon medical marijuana. We know that cannabis has medicinal value, not only from the 5,000 years of experience, but from hundreds of studies that have been done at world-class institutions around the world. When Owen finally found something that was calming, it calmed the whole family down. 
But not all was calm in San Luis Obispo County. This is Action News at 11. A raid by armed federal agents. Local medical marijuana users will have to go elsewhere for the time being after federal agents and sheriff's deputies shut off their supply. The Arroyo Grande home of dispensary operator Charles Lynch was also raided Thursday morning. They came in and threw me on the ground and uh, rushed through the house like I was a, a criminal or something. Lynch was cuffed and brought to this federal detention center. How did it happen? The sheriff invited the DEA to raid Lynch's home and dispensary. Charlie Lynch was an easy target since medical marijuana is still illegal under federal law. And um, I had no idea how I was, was going to get out of jail. My family posted a $400,000 bail using uh, their own personal property. Eventually, Lynch got out, but he was far from free. For many months, he's been under various forms of home detention. They applied a, a, a electronic monitoring system to my ankle. The device monitors Lynch's movements. If he leaves his house sometime other than during designated hours, federal agents will know. Each day, he spends two hours charging the ankle monitor. Since the charging cord is so short, he rigged up this extension cord to give himself access to a little more of his home. Without the extra slack, Charlie Lynch wouldn't even be able to use the restroom. Well, we have a sick child. We have a son without a leg that medical marijuana helps. What is it they don't understand about this? We wanted to find out, but neither the sheriff nor the DEA would agree to an interview. The federal government's official position is that marijuana has no medical value. There's an enormous amount of politics that's involved in drug policy and not nearly enough science. A pharmacist can fill prescriptions for medical amphetamines without getting raided. Doctors can even give patients medical cocaine. But medical marijuana, well, that's so dangerous, the DEA busts dispensaries with armed agents. The federal government is the disgrace to science on this issue. Today, Owen uses this cool robo-leg to get around. He's going to college, and his cancer is in remission. But the Becks still can't believe that Charlie Lynch is facing numerous federal charges. In fact, because Lynch had clients like Owen who were under age 21, he faces increased penalties. In California, the average sentence for first-degree murder is 20 years, but if convicted on all counts, Charlie Lynch could face a sentence of 100 years in prison. It's hard to imagine, you know, that uh, they, they would want to do that to me. He's not a man that you would consider, you know, someone who, who needs to spend the rest of their life behind bars. He was just trying to help people. He had a prescription from a doctor at Stanford, and they took his stuff. These guys don't get it. The DEA continues to raid dispensaries all across California. There were 50 raids last year alone. Are we really helping minors by keeping them from medical marijuana at all costs? Or are we treating their parents like children? I think the federal government is too big and too bossy. Charlie Lynch's trial is set for this summer. Jurors probably won't know that state and local laws allowed Lynch to run a dispensary. In a federal case, all that matters is federal law. For Reason.TV, I'm Drew Carey. Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV, and I'm here with Rich Phillips, and we're talking about integrity spirits. And we have these wonderful spirits here in front of us, which we're going to be actually, I'm going to be having a little taste of them. I don't normally drink spirits at all, haven't drunk spirits for years and years and years. So this is going to be kind of an experiment to see what somebody who doesn't drink this kind of stuff thinks of these kinds of things. And maybe I can help describe to you what kind of, you know, taste these these things actually have. But before we do that, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the process of doing this. Okay. <clears throat> the, the, how Can you explain sort of in a nutshell, what's the process of making 
like a distilled alcohol. How, how does this work? I mean, beer, I know you just, you know, you stick it in, in there with the yeast and you sit for a while and it bubbles it's over. Little, and it's a little bit more complex <laughs> yeah. than that. Um, there's a, I mean, and so just trying to break everything down into a nutshell, um, <coughs> you do want to start with some sort of ferment. And you can <coughs> ferment so many things. Anything that, that yeast will go and eat and poop out booze and carbon dioxide, you're, you're good. So, so um, it's like even the whole, the original Polish vodkas, well, there's an argument between Poland and Russia who came up with it first. But if you look at those things, you fermented potatoes because they were cheap. Right, And then exactly. it was rye grains and stuff <coughs> like that. So basically um, you can ferment just about anything. Oh, yeah. Really? And, um, and like our base of vodka is actually a corn base. Hmm. Because corn here, I don't know about nowadays, but it was always um, fairly inexpensive to ferment out, you know, mm -hmm. and right. it was um, and it was fairly free of congeners, which would be things that um, I know. Sky Vodka had this thing where they said they called them impurities, and I wouldn't go so far as to say that. I would say that they are elements that, in some things, you want, and other things you don't. Right. Um, like whiskeys, you want those. Vodkas, gins, absinths, you might not. So your base is right. cleaner. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, you got this. So you would start this, and you get a <clears throat> ferment. And with that, you know, when you when you dump your yeast, you let it do its thing, you're going to get a certain amount of alcohol. And with certain things, you get better results than with other things. But mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that you want to go with the thing that's going to give you the high, highest yield, necessarily. Um, like if you do a rum and you're going to use a cane, well, you can get ferments up to 19% alcohol. However, if you did like say a bourbon or a corn whiskey or even a barley based whiskey, you might get 9% if you're lucky. But then on the other hand, the flavor components that you get out of that right. are worth <clears throat> kind of right. carrying so not, over. Even so though you're not really sick. just looking for alcohol, you're looking for flavor and alcohol. It's a double-edged sword mm -hmm. Yeah. because you kind of want to get as much of a profile as you can, but then you want as much output as you can get. Right. And <clears> because <throat> realistically, Say I took a uh, thousand gallons of something at nine percent. What do I have? Ninety gallons. Right. And then I ferment that. And when you remove your lighter vapors, which are butanols, methanols, and things that are better for cleaning the floor. Yeah, I don't you know, think it made me want drinking methanol. The things that you could drink your or power your car with yeah. or whatever. Those things, once you remove those, and then depending on what you're making. The tail end, when you start to pull your water vapors and the heavier vapors in, some of those things you keep to a degree and some of the thing, those things you leave. And so you might end up with 75 gallons. Right. Well, it's barely enough. You know, you filled a barrel. Yeah. And then you got a little bit left, and that's going to go to the evil warehouseman because they're always going to drink their share. <laughs> but um, but it's just one of the – it's it's different, and it, everything – like even right. everything we make right now – we have to treat differently, and right. we look at it differently um, because of what it is. Now, what's the difference between uh, like a whiskey that comes out tan or pinkish or mm -hmm. brown and these, which are clear? Why, well, why are these clear? Well, here's the issue. Is no matter what it is, if it comes off a still, it's clear. Oh, okay. Because you're stripping these, you're stripping vapors. Right. So... Think about collecting steam or whatever. You're stripping these vapors. Right. No matter what color it was, because when we make absinthe, the steep sacks that we do are pretty dark, milky, soupy green. You right. know, and they're pretty bitter and everything because the wormwood is the second most bitter agent that we know of right. in the plant world. But when you redistill it, it ends up being more, almost a more floral botanical thing right. but everything comes out clean and so the color is derived from how it rests in the oak and oh, it pulls out tannic acids from the oak and it also pulls out vanillins and everything else and that's what gives it this gives it the color, color. Oh, but I also see. it's even more than that because if you could consider um, cooking down a chicken stock for example right you know in one sense you could say gee i'm losing liquid and so you're losing volume but on the other hand, you're condensing flavor. Right, exactly. And that's another thing that oak does. And I know that it's probably, who knows if it's true, but the lore is 
that it was Elijah Craig, who is now kind of a venerable uh, bourbon distiller, who was also a Southern Baptist minister back in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Well, he was using white oak barrels to transfer because he got a contract to sell his whiskey down in New Orleans, and he was transferring this right. stuff. Well, nobody thought about it. But the long trip, it aged. Oh, right. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they got it, and they said, hey, this is brown over here. No. But it was smoother and more complex and tasted better, and so. that was how it was born. And plus, he had these oak barrels that I think they'd used to house fish in or something like that. And he thought, oh, I can't afford to get new ones. So, so I'll use some he, fish barrels. <laughs> well, then you're going to get that smell. Exactly. So that's when he burned the inside of it and charred the oak on the inside and so it would eradicate any of that smell but then even that that charring so you had charcoal on the inside served as an active filter for the whole thing right and so, so. I mean but a lot of these things are born out of whether they're myths or not right you never we know still how much use is myth, those same how much procedures is myth today. And how much is yeah but mm -hmm. it's people found out that what produced out of it was worked and so they're willing to try it. And plus it was hooch, see? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, let's let's try one of those. What one do you suggest that we try? I would start with just the straight vodka. Okay. Because that's right. the cleanest thing for the palate. Okay, and that's interesting because I, I have never been much of a fan for vodka. Uh, well, and I'll warn you, either way, if you're not much of a drinker and you're not used to running a still, 80 proof is still hot. Yeah. But what we did do is um, we put about 200 times the surface area on filtration than anybody else that we knew of. And let me, let me just smell this. Mm -hmm. Let me see what it is. And it doesn't smell alcoholic. No. It has sort of an aromatic smell to it, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting because I, I always associate something like that. And just a tad. <laughs> I know. I never know what a tad is. <laughs> yeah, give me a snort. Okay. But, we have to do this real quickly, but let me just let me just taste what this tastes like. Oh, it's not as burny as I thought it would be. And it's that's very filtration. And it tastes like um, it tastes more like a liqueur than an alcohol. I think yeah. I think the issue too is that um, when I was bored. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I had a chamomile to the mix. Chamomile, okay. And, um, you know, Kieran came by one day and he's like, what are you, crazy? What are you doing? Oh, that's, yeah, and you I can just, actually smell it now. Yeah, so I. Now I that you just, said that, mm -hmm. I can actually, let me see it. And so he tried it and he's like, he goes, okay, well, that's just good, stupid enough, it might work, you know. But we really liked, because we're so used to dealing in botanicals right. in general. That's figured, incredible. That, now well that you that. said that, mm -hmm. now I can taste the chamomile. Okay, I'm going to put that one down there. Yep. And very quickly, we only have a few seconds. Now, which one's this? This is the hazelnut. Hazelnut. Because it's different. We take okay. 15 pounds of hazelnuts. Right. And, and we re-roast different... them. It has a very different smell to it, but yep, it's not sweet. No, um, but it's a, if it's a vodka, you don't want it to be cloying. What does that mean? Mm. Cloying, like overpowering, or it's going to change uh, the flavor profile. No, that's funny. It does have a nutty taste, but it doesn't taste quite like hazelnuts. Yeah, and it's, that's interesting. But it very never touches. Taste. It never touches the liquid. Right. Actually, what we do is we suspend this 15 pounds of hazelnuts in a mesh sack over the vapor barrier. So it gets barrier, the vapors. And the vapors oh, have to travel Oh, so it doesn't actually it. go into it. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Now, before I try that one, I'm getting all kinds of signals. We're going to go to another quick short. This one's going to be a little one, and we're this is Earth Magic Tours and and Judith. Golden, appropriate name, was on our show a few months ago, and she's a lady who travels to Cambodia and takes all kinds of school supplies to kids in Cambodia. And this was one of the tours that she did, delivering school supplies to some of the children in Cambodia. And this was in a town called Rulus, which was built between 877 and 910 A.D. So this is quite an old place. So this is Earth Magic Tours.
Hi, welcome back to Freedom TV, and we're here with Integrity Spirits, and we're actually trying some of these really unique uh, liquors. Are these called liquors? Do they call them liquors? Sure. I mean, you could call them spirits. Spirits, eh, liquors. It's easier that way. But cause... they are really unusual from the aspect that I don't drink spirits, mm -hmm. and we've already tried two of them, and they've just been not like drinking a distillate, because normally distillates, I kind of go... When I come close to well, even the looking idea at them, is, is that you can, depending on how you distill it out, right. you can make it have a softness to it. Right. And it doesn't have to have the, I guess, the heat that people would associate yeah. with all that stuff. Yeah, that feels like the roof of your mouth is on fire. Exactly. Yeah. And you've got to think, <laughs> yes, those are ethanol vapors. And yeah. Yeah, they're going to do this and that. But you can create something depending on how you distill right. it out. Everything that's not going to have that perception. But you know, a lot of times. It's been a long time since we were free to do this stuff, and it was right. very difficult even for us to get our licensing. Yeah, I can imagine. And so, you know, you think back to the age of prohibition, um, bathtub gin was a grim reality. Yeah. Because people are going to get their drink on no matter what they do. Yeah. But they made a lot of inferior stuff. And so it's taken so long. I mean, look how long it's taken just for the beer industry to, to come up with some of the things that were so profoundly great. Yeah. And, and, and that were probably around 150, 200 years were. ago. And, and then went and out so of the then, market. This is kind of the second wave of that thing. And now you have a lot of little guys like us. And, I mean, we've just started a, a distiller's guild in Oregon. Hmm. And we've got... 18 members, I think, right hmm. now, and it's still small enough and cool enough that I can hang out with all the guys that, you know, do Medoya vodka or, you know, right. competitors, theoretically, but we'll hang out and drink beer together, and we'll talk about how are we going to do this, that, and the other thing. Excellent. And it's, it's wonderful, because the quality that we're getting out of these guys is phenomenal. Okay, I think we actually have um, someone calling in with a question, and you are free to call in. So do you have a, a question for, for Rich? Yeah, I was wondering. It sounds like there's a lot of um, uh, leftovers. I don't mean what you're drinking on the table there, but I mean, as far as the, the mash or whatever, what happens to that afterwards? Oh, okay. What, what happens to uh, the mash and stuff after you do the distilling process? It would be good if you could make a pie with it. A pie? Oh! Being facetious. <laughs> no. it's, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, really? So oh. that you wind up with a lot of stuff left over. Can you compost it? You can. You think it would compost pretty well? Mm-hmm. A lot of drunk worms out there but they walking like that around. Sort of thing. Yeah, that's true. They do like that. That'd be kind of interesting to experiment with and see what you could do with that and see how it would work like as a mulch, mm -hmm. and what would happen with some of the plants and see how it would work as far as keeping pests away. Or maybe they might just kind of go for it. Who knows? It's a lot of residual sugars in there. That so. yeah, that is kind of an interesting idea. Now we have another one. This one's. This the, is gin. the gin. Okay. This is 12 bridges. Let's try 12 bridges gin and let's see. Oh. Yeah, let's see Juniper can... trees. Well, no, but it's it's a little bit more understated, but let's see if you can get the fancy ingredient. The fancy. Oh boy. Now we're trying. Let me see if I can taste it. That's exotic. That's really exotic. That's, that doesn't taste like a spirit or a distillate. That tastes more like something you'd have for dessert. Oh, I can't tell. You'll have to tell me. I can, it's different. It's, it's odd. Well, I know that we've all argued over who got the privilege of peeling and seeding a flat of cucumbers for every batch. Oh, no. But that's one thing really? that's in there. Cucumbers. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I think it's That's usually amazing. Jeff Howard that prefers to peel the cucumbers. Oh, that's amazing. So you putting you can actually put things like vegetables well, of course. into distillates and change the flavor. That's amazing. And we, we put that in the vapor stream, and so it will flow through. So it and flows. It will the vapor the comes up and, out of those. and extracts the oils out. So you don't actually put the thing in the distillate at Not all. The it's just a very and there light. are some things that we gosh, do. That's Steve. amazing. But yeah, it's 
Mm. Oh, it's so great. And it took... Uh, okay. <clears throat> oh, now, let's see. Kieran says that it took him two and a half years or something really? to come up with that. Amazing. But it's a clever, interesting... Now, this you're putting water with the absence and it changed color. What happened? There are <clears throat> um, esters in, uh, in absinthe that come from anise. They are soluble in alcohol, but not in water. Oh, and so that so. was always the cool thing. It was the trademark of a real absinthe is that you could, and typically we do it a lot more slowly. You know, you drip it in there right. and you could and see it see cloud, it's cloud and stuff and like that. Around. Because it pushes these, these esters out of solution and they're called, a, it's a group called anethols. Amazing. And this is, and this particular product was illegal for decades it in the United States. It was illegal for almost 100 years. 100 years. Since 1912. Really? Um, and it was largely in part with, uh, that was a silly thing, largely because of, um, of demonization from the wine industry. Oh, because right. in the 1860s, phylloxera was uh, a parasite that actually specifically destroyed the, the root stocks of uh, vines, like wine vines. Oh, and stuff so like that. if you get rid of that. Well, the wine industry was almost oh, done. Okay. And, and so they actually had to get clones from North America. They tried to get back on their feet, but at that time, it was less expensive to buy a high proof bottle of absinthe than it was to buy a bottle of wine. Okay. Well, I think, oh, sorry to interrupt you, but I think we've got a, uh, we've only got one more minute, I think. And we have a caller, so I wanted to make sure the caller got in. I just want to try that too. Yes, do you have a question for for Rich? Yes, Rich. I was wondering. Um, I hope you don't mind my asking, but in, in uh, looking over the absinthe that's available in Oregon now, uh, and having the original recipes, which I, I do possess, I've noticed that many of the manufacturers that have been uh, putting absinthe out on the market in the state of Oregon don't, do not include. Uh, they don't include absinthe as one of the ingredients. Um, I didn't know if there was a reason for that. Or, excuse me, what did I say? Absinthe. They do not include angelica root as one of the ingredients in their absinthe. I wondered if you do, by chance. It is one of the... Angelica root. I think he was questioning about whether some of the people who produced absinthe didn't include the ingredient of angelica root. Well, we don't, because angelica is not one of the traditional things wormwood right. might be what he's thinking yeah that's possible um, we are we are using artemisia absinthium right okay we've got to go i don't want to go let me quickly taste very quickly oh my god mm, yum the ultimate anise experience here thank you i want to thank you so much for being thank on you. the show and bringing all these wonderful little boutique things for us to try out here and show people because it's exciting to me for you to be here in Oregon doing this and being entrepreneurial to make it happen. Thanks for joining us on Freedom TV. We'll see you next week. I cry for my country For the pain that it's been through She's been made to suffer For the profit of a few Storm clouds are out forming Winds of change now touch our shores I hear forefathers are crying as the dreams been cruised America